Hi, my name's Jo Middleton. I write a blog called Slummy Single Mummy. Um, I've got two daughters, they are 12 and 19, and I'm very ashamed to say that up until this week I've never had a will, which I know is really terrible. Um, so I'm here today at Cooperative Legal Services in Bristol to talk to James Antonio, who's going to tell me everything I need to know about writing my will. Hello, Jo. Hello, James. <laughs> <laughs> so, at the moment, I don't have a will. Mm -hmm. What happens if I die? What's the kind of default yeah. position? Okay, so if you pass away without a will in place, then the what's called the intestacy rules come into play. Okay. And this is basically the laws which govern how your estate is to be distributed, depending upon which relatives you leave. I know there are a lot of people who kind of put off making a will because they think it's really complicated or maybe really expensive. Mm -hmm. Is there like a standard amount that people should expect to pay? For having a will written? There is, I mean, it depends who, who writes the wills, um, and there is a range of prices. You can always find things that are free, um, yeah. but the question is whether or not what you're getting is the right thing for you. Um, a typical professionally drafted will will cost around about £150 for a single will, maybe £250 for what we would call a mirror will, so that would be a, a mirror for a couple that wanted okay. had similar wishes. And for that, would you expect that? the person writing the will to be able to offer you kind of advice or are they just there to kind of take down your wishes? Well if you're getting a professional, a professionally drafted will you'd certainly expect to have a conversation about your circumstances mm -hmm. and make sure that you've actually considered um, not necessarily what you think you should have but also to consider other things like for example um, you may want everything to go to your children but actually what if one of your children had died before you would you want it to go to your surviving child, or mm. if that child had had their own children, would you want that share to go down to your grandchildren and things like that? So it would be part of the conversation would be to explore perhaps the unexpected, and that's yeah. the sort of the added value you get with going with somebody professional, as opposed mm -hmm. to just perhaps trying to write the will yourself or using a form which is sort of predetermined and you're filling in the boxes. Because I know a lot of people you see those kind of will writing kits in Smiths or um, offers on Groupon and yep. things like that. Are they, do they, I mean I guess they must have a place, but then you're relying on your own kind of exactly right. amount of your own expertise. Exactly right, and that's the risk. You can still use those kits and come out with a valid will, mm. but you're obviously not getting the, the, the advice and expertise that goes around that will and also to let you know what your options are as well so mm. there may be things that actually you didn't know you could do in a will that actually a professional will be able to explain to you. And are there certain things like parts of the process that make it official like could I just get a piece of paper and write down I want to leave everything to such and such mm. and get a couple of friends to sign it would that be <laughs> legally binding? Uh, uh, it doesn't sound like it <laughs> to be honest with you but um, the, the, the laws do tell you how a will needs to be signed in order for it to be actually valid and in force. Um, again, the question would be, um, is that will the right will for you? Because one of the big problems is that, with certainly with homemade wills, is the ambiguity. Mm. So actually there's certain words and certain phrases that in your mind you are setting out what you want to do, but actually after your death, if there's somebody else looking at what you've written, it could be interpreted in different ways. Mm -hmm. So when we're writing wills, we use a certain language, and it's not always the most popular, but we try and keep it as plain English as possible um, to set out very clearly uh, what your wishes are to avoid ambiguity and to try and avoid disputes after your death. So I can't just go like Agatha Christie style and get a, like a quill and a scroll <laughs> and write it all out by hand. I quite fancy that. Okay. Um, so you, you mentioned briefly there about how you can allow in your will for future changes in circumstances, which mm -hmm. I think is quite interesting. So if is there a way that you can write your will? So, for instance, if you know you're going to be getting married soon or you're pregnant but yep. you know, don't have the baby yet, are there ways of incorporating yes. those kind of future changes into a will? Absolutely. So provided that it's worded in the right way, um, for example, one of the points you mentioned there was about marriage. Now, mm -hmm. when you get married... Uh, the law automatically revokes any previous will that you may have written. Okay? Okay. However, if you are planning to get married to somebody or enter into a civil partnership, then you can draft your will in such a way that it takes into account the marriage that's coming up. 
so that when you do get married, the will doesn't get revoked. So, so you can future-proof it to that extent. Okay, that's good. What you can't do is to say, if I get married at all at some point in the future, yeah. then I don't want this will to take effect. Then you can't do that. It needs to be my marriage to X. Okay, so a named person. Correct. So if you'd had a baby, for instance, in, the, in your will you'd said just shared between my children. Do the children have to be named? No, no, you can, you can uh, in your will, you can draft in sort of classes of people. So you could say, uh, my children, my grandchildren, nieces and nephews, if you like, um, and it's basically what you have at the time that you pass away. If you don't have children, then that clause just won't come into effect. Okay, that's interesting. Um, and how about if you wanted to kind of leave money to charity or something like that? Is that something you just, that's just like an extra line, is it? You can just include things like that? <laughs> uh, well, it'd be more than, more than a line, but, <laughs> but you could, uh, you can of course leave uh, gifts to charities in your will. Um, you can leave um, specific cash amounts if you want to. Mm -hmm. You can leave them a proportion uh, of your estate, or you can even leave them personal possessions if you want to. Um, they can certainly be included as beneficiaries. You just need to be very clear on uh, the the name of the charity, and you would mm -hmm. also want to make reference to their registered charity number because a yeah. lot of charities out there they've got quite similar names, mm -hmm. and certainly they've got similar purposes. So you just want again this whole point about avoiding ambiguity, making sure that your will is clear on exactly who you want to benefit. Mm. And I guess as well there must be kind of different ways of doing things. So you could specify an amount, or I guess you could specify a percentage. Yeah, absolutely. So you can, do, when you draft your will, you're, what you're doing is putting in place um, a structure. So whether you are worth £100,000 when you pass away or £200,000, mm -hmm. what you're aiming to do is to say, actually, regardless of what I've got, this is how I want my estate to be distributed. So you can still leave a cash fixed amount if you want to, and then you can leave proportion. So 30% here, 20% there, 10% here, or equally between as many children as I have at the time of my death. That's all possible. Because I read stories sometimes where, you know, like a... a family member dies and they've left a quarter of a million pounds their entire estate to like the donkey sanctuary mm -hmm. and all the family are really annoyed. Are there ever grounds for kind of contesting that or saying actually that's not fair or is it just yeah, that's it, the person's it does happen it does happen um, and it does create uh, issues it's one of those things where when we're advising uh, our customers and clients that if they are looking to do something that is likely to cause issues in the future after their death amongst their family, then one consideration would be do I sit down and do I discuss it with my family and explain the reasons why I've, I've drafted my will in this way. Mm. It's not so much of the I'm leaving everything to charity, but actually you see a lot of arguments over personal possessions. Mm. You know, why did I leave, you know, why did mum leave my earrings, the, her earrings to my sister and not to me? Yeah. You know, it's those sorts of things that can cause a lot of, a lot of uh, problems within the family. Mm. Um, so it's always better, again, particularly if you're dealing with children and the, uh, the parent is uh, leaving an unequal distribution between the children, there may be a very good reason for that. They may have made loans or gifts to other the, to the other child, for example. But if they're looking at doing something like that, we would recommend that they consider sitting down and having a, a frank conversation with the children as to why they've uh, they've done their will in that way, because it can avoid a lot of problems um, after their death. So, when you're thinking about kind of leaving money to children who are under eighteen, I mean, hopefully that won't happen mm -hmm. with me. Um, What's the procedure then for kind of how they inherit that money? Because I'm guessing you can't just give a nine-year-old like a house. No, <laughs> no. Um, so you can in your will uh, stipulate the age uh, that the child is to receive the money. Okay. So the default position will be 18. But if you were mean, you could say like 35 and tease you, them? You could do. There wouldn't be very, very practical <laughs> reasons for doing that. You can also include in your will, you can also give um, certain powers in your will so that even if you did stipulate, uh, stipulate quite a, a lengthy age contingency, so mm. 25 or 30, you can give powers to your uh, trustees who would be the guardians of that money. Uh, yeah. whilst the child was under that age. You can give them powers to advance money to that child if, for example, they, were, they needed some money to go to university, so for their education, for their maintenance, if they wanted to put a deposit down on a house, for example, if there was a good reason, you can include in your will the powers for your trustees to do that. 
And when you're appointing a trustee, would that normally be the same person that you would appoint as their guardian, or might there be reasons for... No, norm it normally it's the same person. Normally it would be the same people, because your executors are responsible for carrying out the terms of your will and administering your estate, yeah. and your trustees are responsible for managing any ongoing trusts that arise from the terms of your will. So they would, they would normally be the same, the same people, Mm -hmm. uh, because it, it's still a, you know, it's a responsibility on both sides of the coin. Um, there may be reasons, specific reasons, to actually choose different trustees if you wanted to, uh, but most of the time they're the same. Okay. And when you're thinking about appointing guardians, obviously you need to sit down and talk to them mm -hmm. about it first, but I'm thinking of a circumstance where perhaps you, you've spoken to somebody, they've agreed that they would be a guardian, but then on the event of your death, actually their circumstances have changed. Are they able to say, actually, no, I don't want to do that? Yeah, no, abs absolutely. Um, they can, they don't have to take on the child. Okay. Uh, obviously, it would be a difficult situation. Uh, but in those circumstances, it would be for somebody else who was willing to take on that role to go to court to get the court order for parental responsibility. And can you specify more than one person in your will? So, you know, if so-and-so can't do it? You can appoint substitutes as well. Okay, well, that's quite handy then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what you need to think about is that when appointing guardians, they're going to essentially be stepping into your shoes and raising your child. Mm. So things to think about are um, uh, what are their moral values, what are their ethical values, what yeah. are their religious beliefs, are they going to bring the child up in the same manner with which you would want your child to be mm. brought up. Also, and importantly, is the age of the guardian that you appoint. Yeah. Because many customers say, well, actually, you know, I'll appoint my parents to look after my child. And that's fine, but the, ch the parents may, at the time of writing the will, be 65. Yeah. And they're quite willing to take on the role. However, if you weren't to pass away for another 10 years or another 15 years, mm -hmm. they could be pushing on to 75, 80 years of age. And they may not feel comfortable with having to look after a teenager perhaps at that time. No. So it's things like that thinking about, thinking ahead, planning ahead, trying to think for think about, you know, what would happen, not about what happens now, but what would happen if something if you were to pass away in mm -hmm. five, ten, fifteen years time. So I guess one of the other things that a lot of people think about when writing a will is their funeral plans. Are you able to include funeral plans in a will and is that legally Binding. Mm -hmm. So you can include your funeral wishes, that's quite a common clause in a will, yeah. whether you wish to be buried or whether you wish to be cremated. You can be as detailed as you like if you want mm -hmm. to, you can set out what you would like everyone to wear, you could set out what songs you would like to be played, etc. Yeah. Um, and that's certainly possible. Um, it's not legally binding, uh, it is an expression of a wish, so you mm -hmm. would be relying upon your executor to, to fulfil those wishes as you've set out in your will. Uh, an alternative would be for you to actually arrange for a funeral plan during your lifetime, yeah. uh, and that's something that the cooperative um, offers, uh, where you can actually set out your own wishes, have a discussion um, to decide what you want to do, um, and then you can make reference to that funeral plan in the terms yeah. of your will. I've always been quite curious about that as to why like, such a legal document, that the funeral aspect of it isn't legally binding. Is there a reason... Well, uh, in, the, in the eyes of the law, the, the disposal of the body or the responsibility for the disposal of the body lies with the executor. I guess it doesn't matter, does it, once you're dead? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, to be, to, we do get some uh, customers who say that actually I'm not really fussed either way, whether I'm buried or cremated. Mm. Um, why should it matter? Um, and my answer to that is, well, actually, at the point that you have passed away, it's normally quite a distressing time for the family. Mm. And it can be quite a confusing time as well. And what they want to do is make sure that your wishes are carried out. So yeah. even if you're not 100% convinced one way or another, my view is that it's always better to put something down, because actually what that does is it helps the family at a very difficult time just cling on to a bit of certainty. That's a good point, yeah. So, you, so that's one of the responsibilities of the executor. What other responsibilities do they have? So it's, it's, it's uh, heavily burdened with responsibility. It's a very serious role. Um, it's the, the responsibility is to essentially wind up your life. Mm -hmm. So they will need to establish what assets are in your estate, what liabilities are in your estate. They will need to get values of those assets and liabilities. Um, they will then uh, need to establish whether what's called a grant of probate um, is required in order to deal with those assets. 
and uh, a grant of probate is basically a court order and it's where the court recognises the validity of your will and it recognises the appointment of the executors in it. Uh, the reason for getting a grant of probate or needing a grant of probate it's so that the outside world knows who has authority to deal with assets that are in your name. And do, when you're thinking about your will and planning, do you need to know the exact value of your assets at that point, or is it enough for you to kind of say, my house or you know, my it's, yacht? It's not essential, um, unless you want advice about inheritance tax and you want an understanding of whether or not you're going to suffer inheritance tax. Mm -hmm. What you need to bear in mind is that actually what you have now is somewhat irrelevant because it's only actually what you have when you pass away mm. that, that really matters. And um, we do commonly ask the question, well, I don't really have anything to leave. Why do I need a will? And, and the answer is, well, actually, because you don't know what you're going to have when you pass away. Yeah. And people tend to forget that if their parents are still alive, the chances are they're going to receive an inheritance. They may play the lottery. You know, you never know what life has you know, in store for you. So it's all about planning. It's about planning for life's unexpected events as well. Um, and you can capture that all in a will. If you thought you might be the beneficiary of a will, because I have this kind of idea, like I might have like a long lost aunt <laughs> that I've never met, and she's actually <clears throat> left me a million pounds, but I don't know about it. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to find out if you were a beneficiary, if nobody's told you, or is it like a public document that you can go and... So search? there's a couple of routes you have uh, here. You can either contact um, the, the family and try to establish who is the executor of the estate, if there is one. Hmm. Uh, and if you find out there's an executor, get in contact with them and simply ask the question. In theory, they should contact you or at least try and find you um, as part of their administering the estate. Yeah. If, however, that's not an option, then what you can do is you can approach the probate registry and you can put in place um, what's called a standing search so that you would give the name of the deceased and the date of death um, and then they would uh, notify you if a grant of probate uh, was produced for that estate and then that will give you the name of the executors and you'll also be able to see the terms of the will as well. Um, and when it... When you've actually kind of uh, gone through the process of planning, you've put together your will, what's then the next step in terms of all the witnessing and the signatures? Because I think people will imagine it's quite a long process. But No, it's, it's, it's reasonably straightforward, but there is a very strict process that has to be adhered to. Mm. Um, in order to make sure your will is put in place properly, you need to be able to sign it. You need to sign it in the presence of two witnesses. Mm -hmm. um, those witnesses should be over 18, they should be independent, so they shouldn't really be a relative, and they, shouldn't, okay. they should certainly not be a beneficiary named in the will. Right, and they have to be there together at the same time? So there, are some, there are some rules around it, but to keep things safe, get yeah. two people in the, the, at the same time, to, uh, they don't need to read the terms of the will, they don't need to see the terms of the will, they just need to be a witness to the fact just that you've signed the will signed. and they will leave their details. That's the safest approach to take. Okay, and then, so once you've got it signed, um, it's all finished, what do you do with it then? I'm guessing you don't like hide it in a drawer and lock it away. And some people do, some <laughs> people do. It may not be the best approach to take. Um, what we would always recommend and what we do for, for our customers, we offer a free uh, will storage service. So okay. um, once you've signed the will, we would then basically store it somewhere that's completely safe um, and then we would give you a photocopy of that signed will for your records. And what we would also offer to do is if you would like we can give you further copies if you wanted to share it with your executors or if you wanted to share it with your, with your, with your children so that they know what mum's will says and where it's being stored. Okay, that makes sense. So once you've made your will, how often do you recommend that people go back and review it and make changes? Mm -hmm. I'd suggest that every three years as a general rule, uh, but also earlier if you have one of life's events occur. So mm -hmm. if you are having a baby, if you're getting married, if you're buying a house, if you're getting divorced, um, if you're retiring, those sorts of things should all be key triggers for you just to say, actually, I'm going to spend five or ten minutes just going through my will just to make sure it's all up to date. Mm. And should you expect to pay to make those changes? Well, if you are obviously if you're reviewing the will yourself, there's no cost. Yeah. Um, but you can go back to uh, to the to the to the organisation that wrote the will. Uh, you can have an initial discussion because sometimes actually a change is not formally need, doesn't formally need to be made. For yeah. example, 
if you change address. Um, you know, it's not necessary, absolutely, that uh, you know you have to change your will. It doesn't necessarily affect the validity of the will. Um, it could be something where we could just update our records. Alternatively, it may be something more fundamental than that, and it will need an actual amendment to your will. Um, and it's important to know that if you want to make amendments to your will, it needs to be done properly. You can't just write over the top of your existing Scribble will or out. start scribbling things out, um, because again, it goes back to you know creating a lot of problems after your death. So then do you need to have it re-signed by the two witnesses for any changes that you make? Uh, yes, you would do. You'd need to re-execute it in the same way that you signed the first one. Okay. Can you tell me a bit more about power of attorney and what that means? Yep, absolutely. So um, I think you're referring to lasting power of attorney. Oh, yeah, that's one. Yep. Um, and the lasting power of attorney is a very important document uh, and it's where you uh, legally appoint another person to have authority over your affairs. Okay, and this is during your lifetime, so this is completely separate from writing your will. Um, this is making sure that um, if you need to, that there is somebody that you trust who has authority um, to deal with either your financial affairs and your property, um, or alternatively your health and welfare decisions. Okay, so they would be able to do things like um, if you had any kind of care costs or anything like that that you needed later in life, that person would be able to kind of take the money out of your estate. Basic, that basic, sort of but that's that's one that's one example of what an attorney would be able to do. Yeah. Um, we need to bear in mind that you may never lose your ability to make your own decisions. Yeah. Um, however, through, <laughs> through, uh, through, uh, through old age or through accident or through illness, you may get to a stage in life where you're unable to make those decisions. Now, mm -hmm. if you have a lasting power of attorney in place, you've got somebody that you trust appointed who can then make those decisions and carry out those actions on your behalf. Mm -hmm. um, the difficulty arises if you don't have one, because a lot of people just assume that, oh my God, spouse will be able to deal with it or the kids will be able to deal with it yeah. um, and not everyone recognises that actually that's not the case they do need to get an authority to deal with your assets okay. um, and it's much more straightforward to put in place a lasting power of attorney um, than the alternative which sees the person uh, go back to, to court and apply to become what's called your deputy mm. um, and that's, that's a, a much more convoluted process that's best avoided. So is that the kind of thing that people should be always thinking of alongside a will? Is it part of a will or a separate it's process? Com it's completely separate, um, however a lot of people do put them in place at the time they write their will. And how do you do it? Okay, um, <laughs> well there's two, there's two uh, types of LPA, one yeah. specifically deals with property and financial affairs, the other deals with health and welfare issues. So you, you've got sort of two options, you can do both, you mm -hmm. can't amalgamate them together, you would have to do two separate okay. documents. You would need to decide who you want your attorneys to be. It could be one person. It could be more. Um, you could appoint replacement attorneys as well, much like as much like the executors that we spoke mm -hmm. about. Uh, we spoke about earlier. Um, you would need to um, decide whether they're going to have full authority over your affairs, or whether you want to restrict what they can do, or you can add in conditions if you want to. Um, you would need what's called a certificate provider as well. And a certificate provider is uh, somebody that's known you for a period of time or is uh, professionally qualified to basically say that you understand the nature of the power of attorney and that you're acting under your own free will. Yeah. Um, and they would be part of the process as well. You would need also, if you wanted to get it in place and have it activated, it would need to be registered um, with the Office of the Public Guardian and there is a court fee attached to that as well. It's a lot to think about, isn't it? There's quite, it, is, it is quite involved, but yeah. I can assure you that it's a lot less involved than if you have to go down the alternative yeah. route of not having an LPA in place. Mm, definitely. That's the kind of thing, though, that I would not think about. Absolutely. absolutely. And raising awareness of it is, is, is mm. key because it's such an important document and it, it really uh, can have a significant impact on your loved ones if they do need to start making decisions, if you are going to require um, uh, residential care, for example, um, having this put in place, it just alleviates such a huge burden on them. So thinking about dying without a will in place, if you happen to be living with a partner, you're unmarried, as is fairly typical nowadays, what's the default position there? I guess a lot of people would just assume that they're 
cohabiting partner would absolutely and, and that's one of the that's one of the big myths I think the, the notion of uh, common law marriage mm. um, it doesn't actually exist so if you are living together even as, as, as a married couple but you're not actually married or in a civil partnership um, then there is no automatic entitlement for that partner regardless of how long you've been together regardless of whether you have children together um, without a will in place there's no automatic provision under the intestacy rules for the partner. So say you'd bought a house together, kind of 50-50 share, potentially then that one partner left behind could be faced with having to sell the house and hand over half of the money? And potentially. Um, it depends on how you own the property. So there are two ways really you can own property. One is what's called joint tenants, uh, the other is called tenants in common. Most people own their property as joint tenants, that's the more traditional way, and what that means is, is that if one of the, one of the parties dies, uh, the ownership of the property automatically passes to the survivor and doesn't go in accordance with uh, the will, doesn't go in accordance with the terms of the intestacy rules. Okay. Um, the other way of owning it is what's called tenants in common, um, and that's where you each own a, a fixed percentage of the share of the property. So, yeah. for example, if you've put in um, unequal amounts, you've contributed unequal amounts to the purchase of the property, it's more likely that it's held as tenants in common. Yeah. But it's certainly an option that your conveyancing solicitor will, will give you. And I guess nowadays, like, you quite often have friends or siblings buying houses together yeah, who won't want that to pass on to a friend. Absolutely. Yeah. So, the difference between the two is really key because actually, if you own it as tenants in common, then your share of the property will pass in accordance with the terms of your will. Well thank you James, it's been really interesting to find out everything involved in making a will and I shall definitely be getting home and getting mine witnessed and signed as soon as possible. So thank you very much. Thank you.